as we uh, have Dan come up and share the word of God, I want you guys to open your hearts. Rochelle, I didn't know you were going to say that scripture. That was, that was perfect. Um, just really showcases how we need to be active hearers. We need to let our walls down. We need to stop guarding the lies. Isn't it crazy that we can actually build a fortress around the lies we believe? You know what I'm talking about? When somebody tries to say, hey, that doesn't seem like Jesus. And you're like, oh, oh, oh this is why. That's a wall. <laughs> it's like, we call it poking the bear. And, uh, but we have to let those walls down and say, God, this isn't something that I want to, I don't want to stay like this. So I, I, I love the way that that scripture just showcased that. And uh, Dan, we thank you so much for being a beacon of truth. And you are a pioneer. I thought that song was just perfect because you're pioneering the desire, the heart, and the, and the mindset of the word of God being preeminent in each believer's life. And I believe that we're here today because we thank God for the truth of the word of God. And we're so blessed that you can release it today. Can you guys put your hands together and welcome Dan Muller. Mighty man of God. Mighty. Oh, grab your chairs. Well, don't grab your chairs. Sit down. <laughs> there is no chairs. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That was a good song, wasn't it? Yeah. Wow, you're a pioneer. So, uh, Pastor David was talking about sometimes saying I heard that before that can be a real trap I give you three quick scriptures before we get rolling in Philippians 2 Paul said it's not tedious for me to write the same thing to you over and over so Paul was writing about the same stuff a lot yeah he said for you it's a safeguard that's Philippians 2 Hebrews 2 says take earnest heed of the things you've heard at least they slip away you can't just say, well, I heard that. You got to become that. Amen. You can know the word and not become the word. You can know the whole Bible and not have fellowship and intimacy with God. And you can quote the whole Bible. It's not about knowing what the word says. It's about knowing him. Yes. And when you know him, your life gets transformed. It's relational. It's not intellectual. Yeah. Knowledge can puff you up. Yeah. But love edifies. So here's Paul saying, it's not tedious for me to write over and over to you again the same thing because I know it's going to guard you and keep you safe if you'll take heed. Hebrews says, take earnest heed of the things you've heard, lest they slip away. Second Peter chapter 1, two-thirds of the way through the chapter, he writes this glorious, it's a gospel chapter. You ought to check it out sometime. It's in your Bible. It's Second Peter chapter 1. It's really good. <laughs> and two-thirds of the way after he shares all this great stuff and tells you that you'll never lack entrance into the everlasting kingdom of God. And it says that if you do these things and add these things to your life, you'll never stumble. Like people don't even want to touch and preach that stuff. What do you do with, if you live in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh? That sounds like a pretty solid place to live, but you can't hardly preach that stuff in America today. Because people preach you're expected to fail, and you're going to fail every day, and you wake up to fail, and thank God for the blood. We're not thinking about becoming and growing up in him in all things, and walking in righteousness, and proving your fruit unto holiness, because righteousness will change your life. <laughs> Come, on. Come on, there's some scriptures in the Bible that are phenomenal. I mean, be holy for he's holy. What's that look like? Well, we can't do that, brother. Well, it's amazing he's writing about it. I mean, Jesus said, follow me. That's enough right there. Follow me? Jesus said, follow me? Oh, okay. <laughs> Come on, he wasn't setting us up. He's not sitting in the clouds beside the Father going, look, they think I was serious. <laughs> Jesus said, follow me. First John 2 says, any man, any person that says they abide or remain or dwell in him ought to walk even as he walked. Talk about attitude, perspective, nature, motive, heart. Not just miracles and supernatural. Where he lives from. Talk about love. 
I gave you two, Philippians 2, earn, uh, not tedious to write the things over and over, Hebrews 2, take earnest heed of the things you heard. Second Peter chapter 1, two-thirds of the way through the chapter, Peter says this, it's fascinating. He writes this amazing section of scripture and he says, I write these things to you even though you know them and are established in them. See, you can get deceived and say, Peter, you give us a fresh word any day now, bud. We're ready for fresh manna. Peter said, I took the time to write this to you even though I know you know what I'm writing and you're living it. And he still wrote it. (laughs) He said, I think it's safe to stir you by reminding. And then you know what he said? And I'm going to make sure you always have a reminder of these things in front of you even after my departure, meaning his decease, his passing. He said, I'm going to make sure you always have a reminder of these things. It's that vital. It's, it's so foundational. It's so critical. I'm going to make sure you always have this in front of you even after I'm gone. He did a pretty good job, didn't he? Because yeah. we got, in the year 2021, we got Second Peter chapter 1. Yeah. How good is that? Isn't that something? You know heaven and earth going to pass away, fade away? Do you know his word's going to remain? Yes. You know everything he said that's going to stand? He holds all things together by the, the word of his power. Do you understand that his word is infallible and unchangeable? Yes. That if he loved you yesterday, he'll love you today. That means he's going to love you tomorrow. Isn't it cool? I know it sounds a little corny, but a million years from now, whatever that means, a million years from now, he's not going to stop the whole thing and say, Wait! Wait, wait, wait. I don't know what I was thinking, but David, I think I made a mistake. And I'm just kind of changing the way I feel about you. Don't do it. That's a million years. Don't worry about it. A million years. No, the Lord's not going to do that. His love never fails. You know, he's not self centered, he's love. There's no self-centeredness in love. Do you understand that? Do you understand that there's zero selfishness in love? Do you know the biggest corruption of the fall of man is that man was perverted from love to self-centered? That's what happened in the fall of man. It's, it's, we, we, what we always say it's separation from God. I get that, and I understand we say that, but that just sounds so spiritual. It sounds like what we need to say. But what really happened was separation from God. You get cut off from the source of love, become in need of love instead of being love. So So everybody's born into this deficit, this vacuum, this desperate need of love. And we don't recover from that in a lot of our gospel preaching. We stay psychological and we're just trying to meet everybody's need and minister to everybody's need. Our greatest need is to get grafted back in and rejoined and back to the Father and the Father back into me. To know the love of Christ and to be filled with all the fullness of God. That's my biggest deficit. My biggest deficit is I got cut off from the source of love. And I've been trying to find love everywhere else. And guys, it doesn't work because everywhere you're trying to find it, they're trying to find it. And now we got to, I love you, I love you too. Do you love me? Oh, I love you. And it's all, I need you, I need you, I need you. And it seems like it's working and we're running the risk of just getting shattered and broken and hurt and tattered. I love you doesn't mean I need you. You make my world work. Don't jump ship and pull out on me now. I love you means I love you. And I'll lay down my life to see you shine. I'll give everything that he is in me to bring out the best in you. Love you. Not, do you love me? Well, you didn't seem serious when you said it. (laughs) Say it serious. Look, I love you. (laughs) Now there's an argument. Which means your initial I love you. Oh, we go have a good morning. <laughs> Come on, 
well, why don't we just get real? We just we get psychological with the gospel. We're, we're, we're trying to preach a gospel that benefits us in the midst of all this perversion and all this wacky thinking and motives and stuff. Guys, none of what we lived growing up was what he intended. It's perversion. It's Adam. It's the fall of man. It's 180 degrees from the truth. So you don't bring him into your life. He becomes your life. You call all things dead, old things, old things pass away. Talk about mindsets, motives, reason for being, purpose, the why behind your life. Old things. He's not just talking about your actions. He's not just talking about the bad stuff we did. He's talking about the wrong place we thought from and lived from. He's talking about that motive in your life. You can't rise above the why. The why in your life is your ceiling. You can't go past the why. The why is going to locate you and find you out and decide how far you go. Look, I'm, I'm a firm believer of this. I, I, I'm just a believer of this in my heart. I'm convicted of this. That in the end time, when we stand before the Lord, it's not going to be how many kingdoms did you build? How many people did you lead the Lord? How many times did you go to church? How much did you read your Bible? How many people did you evangelize to? Why did you do what you did? Do you know people are in ministry for their own identity? Do you know people do things to get recognized? Do you know people serve in churches to get affirmation? That's why there's so much pain in churches. Because we're trying to find ourselves through one another and we're not doing well with that. How do you get hurt in church if you're walking in love? How can somebody let you down when you're fulfilled in Christ? The only reason you're getting hurt is because you're needing something from someone and they ain't paying up. They don't even know you need it. And now you're going to step out and serve in church. There's people that serve extra time. That could be dangerous if your motive ain't clean. If you're doing it for love, have at it. But nobody should owe you a thing. You can't get hurt if you're serving because of love. If you're just doing it for the kingdom and for people, it ain't like, well, I don't think they appreciate me. That's dangerous. That's the devil's playground. You ought to back out of that servanthood and that ministry and get a grip on your heart before you step back in because you're on the thinnest ice of your life. And now you're going to get hurt in church where you laid down your life. <laughs> And now you're going to leave that church because that church didn't appreciate me and that church hurt me. And now you're going to go to the net church and you're already wounded. You're already guarded. And now you step back into the same old thing and three churches later, the body of Christ is hypocrites and I don't go to church. <laughs> Look, I fly all the time. I talk with people. I, I, I sit beside countless. It's hard not to cry. Countless people. Let's say I used to go to church. I used to go to church. And those people, they don't know what they're into. I, I can get them to cry in five minutes. Five minutes is long. It's probably not five. But, but by five, usually by five, I can have them cry. Because I call them on it and I tell them what they must have experienced and where their heart is and how it's affected them this way. That they were never really pursuing this. They were pursuing this. And they're just not getting it. And now, because they didn't get it, they shipwrecked even with God because they never really got on the boat in the first place. I mean, they seem to, but when somebody hurts you, why aren't you in fellowship with God? When a minister falls and does something unthinkable, why do you fall away from God? Well, he's, well, I don't even think it's real anymore. I don't even know where I... Well, that means you never knew him in the first place. If you're questioning if it's real, your life gets in trial and circumstance and all of a sudden you're ready to throw away faith and say, well, I don't even know if God is out there. That's a scary phrase. That means you've never been with him. You've been hanging around him. You've been singing to him. You've been listening to sermons about him, but you ain't been with him. You never took a walk with him. You never took a ride with him. You never just hung out with him. You're going to question God reality because of circumstances? You never knew him. What you say? You did this and you did that. You did a miracle. You prophesied. You. They're saying, we did all this in your name. He said, I never knew you. You, find, you can't find your identity through ministry. You can't find your identity by being a part of Redemption House Life Center. You find your identity by Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
And when you get that, oh, when we get that, we're going to get that. When we get that, this, this pity, patty, tit for tat, I hurt nation. That, well, how come they? Well, they should have never. Well, I don't know why they did. Well, I'm upset. I'm about to cause you. Come on. That thing will die. That thing will die. When Jesus is really Lord and we're all about him and seeking him, that thing will die. That's, look, I know I'm a little ranting right now, but listen, let's, let's stop calling that normal. Heaven doesn't know what we're doing. It's like, huh? What? All he does is love and show mercy and tender mercies and mercy upon mercy upon mercy. He forgave us and forgave us and forgave us. Not so we have issues. Not so we have opinions. Not so we have attitude. So we have him. Sorry, I'm slipping out, ain't I? I must be flipping out. I'm not even afraid of her right now. I'm not even afraid of her. I usually wouldn't let her touch me when I'm preaching. I'll stay away. You see me. I stay away. I stay away. I preach over here a lot when you're here. <laughs> Come on, this is not why he died. He, he didn't die for you to confess him and stay insecure. He, he didn't die for you to confess him and stay self-centered. He died so you die with him. You die with him. You get crucified with Christ. And when he died, you die. And everything you were and everything you've been and everything you thought. He said, if you're heavy laden, if you're burdened, if you're heavy laden. How many people live burdened and heavy laden? Watch this. This is how we know we're missing it. A whole bunch of people been in church for years and they're still burdened and heavy laden. Waiting for the altar call, for the release, for the lifting, for the... It's, 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 it's your perspective that's bringing the burden. It's the motive in life. It's the way you're seeing things and coming at things. It's that hidden need that you ain't addressing. It's that doing things for affirmation and accolade, for approval and appreciation. Who cares if you got a thumbs up or a thumbs down? He died on a cross and put his life inside of you. He died on a cross to put his life inside of you. Who cares if somebody judges you outward and writes something and said you're this and this and now you're all insecure and you're fighting back and you're trying to prove yourself and get your own redemption. And now you're all distracted. Yeah. <sighs> Sunday morning church. <laughs> not mad at nobody. Crying out. It's not tedious to say this stuff over and over it ain't tedious to write this stuff again and again. You got to take earnest heed, earnest heed, earnest heed. At least these things slip away. And all of a sudden you slip back into an old mindset, old insecure, old frame of thinking. I don't think they care about me. I wonder, they just feel like they changed. And now all of a sudden you're trying to get something back. And it's all, all of a sudden it's about you again. Oh, and the song's right. The song's right. And the words are right to the song we're singing, but when it comes down to it, it you get that? Whew. That's why we gather. That's why every once in a while you give a man a mic, it just freaks out. He just freaks out. <laughs> it's like, hey, where are you living? What are you thinking? Come on, let him take care of the need in your life. We, 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 are, we get so reduced psychologically. We got to have leader meek, be sensitive to our people. We, you got to make sure you appreciate each other. Make sure you're like, that's just, that comes when you're in relationship with God. We shouldn't have to teach this. I used to get freaked out. I was on a board and the staff and I was a pastor. And we'd have meetings about how to keep our people encouraged. Make sure as leaders you write them notes, encourage them, tell them you appreciate them. I'm like, I think we're keeping sickness alive. <laughs> I, th I think we're the prescription for the symptom. And if they don't get their prescription on time, they'll manifest their disease. <laughs> Put on the surface. <laughs> 
But on the surface, on the surface, watch, on the surface, it sounds right, sounds Christian, sounds loving and caring. Are you guys all right? Am I, am I the only one that's losing it here? Beside David? Come on, we do this stuff in leadership stuff. We call it sensitive. We call it compassion. No, I think it's psychological and it's deception. I want to I want to teach people. I want to teach people how not to be broken. You say, "Well, God heals the brokenhearted." Okay, so they're healed. So how many times can we keep being broken? What is he supernatural glue? Going to keep healing my vessel? Why don't you just teach people how not to be broken instead of keep having order calls for the broken and the same broken keep coming up because their perspective don't change. Nothing else changes. So they're vulnerable. They're touchy. You're going to be touched. If somebody owes you something, they're going to let you down. If you have expectations on people, you're getting failed. Bottom line. But if your expectation is from the Lord, You see why these scriptures are in the word? Not to trust in any flesh. We're supposed to love one another and we're supposed to live trustable. But he said, don't trust each other. Why? About the time you get all your heart on a leader, you respect them, and then you find something out that you never wanted to find out and you don't even know how it happened and you're shook to the core. And now you find yourself not even knowing if you can pray, falling apart. That means you were just living this thing. This thing was feeding you, and now you're devastated and shipwrecked. It means you never had him. Look, the whole world, every leader on the earth today could stand up on YouTube and renounce Christ and turn into some wacky thing. I know him. I know him. You all could say, y'all crazy, we're crazy. Let's just go out and get high today, man. Ain't this ain't real? I got a problem. I know him. I'm looking, I'm gonna pick on Freddie Freddie and Roxy. They're cute to me, you're cute together. Because I've been seeing them from the beginning, see? Yeah, even when Roxy really liked Freddie in the beginning. Oh, she she liked you a lot, man. Oh, she told me about it too. She was like, "I just love Freddie. I just I want to be his wife." <laughs> Look how embarrassed I got. Oh, it was so. So watch this. They've been together. Freddie knows Roxy. Roxy knows Freddie. They they doing the baby thing and everything. You gotta know somebody. Oh, Roxy. Freddie knows you, girl, and you know Freddie, right? So wonder if something goes on and all of a sudden one of these, I'm just picking on them because they ain't going to do this, but wonder if one of them just flips and just acts like the other one ain't even there. But it can't can't happen. Because deep in their heart, they what? They know each other. So no matter how goofy you acting and how you putting on a, deep in your heart, what? You know that person because you've been with them. Do you know how many people been around God? For years, been around God. But ain't been with Him. I know it because we live like this. Your whole goal is to know Him. See, Freddie can't never convince me that Roxy don't exist. No matter what he would try to say, I'd look him in the eyes and say, you know her. You've been with her. You've heard her voice. You've been close. Roxy could never say, well, I'm just going to let Freddie in. Girl, you've been with him. You know him. Are you with me? Yeah. The greatest thing you could get in your life is knowing him. You can hang around him all you want. You get stuck in religion. You can do this thing all you want. But when the rubber meets the road, do you know him? Do you know him? 
There's people that said, we ate with you. We were in the streets when you were preaching. And he said, never knew you. Didn't even know you were there. Ain't that something? I'm going to call you to something. I'm going to go, I, I, I done vented on you. I might as well call you to something, all right? <laughs> Come on. You put up with me up till now, most of you. If you'll pursue to get close to him, you won't have to try to ever change your life. Being close to him will change your life. Amen. You're saved by grace. And it's through faith. You got to start somewhere. Like you got to start believing he's here and he loves you. That you're precious to him. That he values you. And you get alone. You start thinking that who he is is in you. Don't get alone and say, God, you got to do something with my wretched, messed up heart. No. God, I thank you. Your heart is in me. And I thank you. You're doing a work in me. You're changing me. You're causing me to see what you see and be who you are. God, I thank you for your grace in my life. I so appreciate your love. Because here's the thing, when you start living up and down and you start getting this thing where, well, David said it about when you talk to somebody, you say, well, and they justify, they're not open, they, they ain't even teachable. They're defending where they are, assuring that tomorrow is always yesterday. And you do a whole nother year of church hiding behind that justification. See, we're not supposed to do church. We're supposed to be her. And it's impossible. Let me, let me, ref, let me emphasize. It's impossible to know him and not be changed by him. He said, if you love, it's because you know him, 1 John 4. If you don't love, just don't love him like you could. It's not a slam. He's not saying you're going to hell. That's what people are like. They're making it heaven, hell. No, I'd rather make it know him or don't know him. Right. Heaven or hell? Come on, that's impersonal. You're going to come to God so you don't go to hell? You're going to come to God so you can go to heaven? You're just going to come to God for blessing, protection, provision? Well, yeah, that's what I thought. No, you come to him to know him. Because Jesus paid to restore what Adam lost. Fellowship, cool of the day. All that he is is in him and all that's in him is in him. They're two or one. Jesus came to restore that truth. He came to save that, not who, that which was lost. He's not just talking about a drunken man in an alley. He's talking about creative value and purpose and destiny. It all seemed lost through sin. So Jesus took care of the sin to get back what was lost. What was lost was union with deity, oneness with God. What was lost was fellowship and relationship with him. Let's not turn this into blessings, provision, and protection. Those things are great. That's part of who God is and it's part of the package. But there's sometimes you don't look protected. I bet Paul didn't feel that way necessarily when he was getting whipped on the back. But he understood that it's all part of living in the world not being of the world. Yeah. See, if you call that no protection, then you'll never step out. If you say, well, every time I step out, all hell breaks loose. Okay, so take another step. And prove to the all hell breaking loose that you ain't selfish and you ain't willful and you love not your own life unto death and you're going to submit to God and resist the thing and it's going to flee. It ain't stopping me. I'm in this thing for keeps. But we're going to step out and minister somebody and all hell breaks loose and we say, well, I ain't stepping out. Every time I try to read my Bible, all kinds of adversity comes. So your answer is stop reading your Bible to get rid of adversity and that proves why you're in this thing for smooth seas. So that means how your life is going defines how you're doing and who you are instead of who he is. Come on, if you're no better than how it's going, you're on a seesaw. And you're up and you're down. And you're praying for better circumstances instead of to know him. When knowing him changes you. Look, 
If you're done wrong in life, everybody's going to get done wrong in life. That's not negative prophecy. That's just the truth. Everybody's going to get done wrong at some level, in some way, in their life. And when you get done wrong, if you're living done wrong, then you don't understand what I'm preaching. Because you've been done so right. At what point do you put on the finished work and face everything from the truth? Where love takes no account of the wrong done to it. You're not living like a man done wrong. You're living like a man that's done beyond right. This is good news. The kingdom of God is here. And don't look here for it and don't look there for it. It's right inside of you. Yeah? And his kingdom and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Talking about you walking in love. Talking about you showing mercy. Talking about you making peace. Talking about you never judging a book by the cover. Talking about you never guard, judging a man according to the flesh, but seeing a man for what he's created for and his purpose and his value. Yeah. Talking about your eyes changing because your heart's new. Yeah. Are you with me? Come on. Man, I've been in this thing for 26 years living Jesus. You see how it gets on me? So do you think I'm just a Sunday performer? Or do you think I see what I'm saying? There's freedom in it. I ain't living up and down. I ain't mountain valley theology. You know, I got to get to the mountain of the Lord. <sighs> okay, son, you've had enough. Now go down into the valley where they all are. And then you pull on me, and you suck me dry, and you overwhelm me. And right when I can't barely take no more, hopefully I have enough wisdom and enough strength to get back up onto the mountain. Of the... I cut a little close, Lord. Okay, son, you've been here long enough. Go back down to where they are. <laughs> I'm making it look so goofy so you never believe it again. <laughs> it ain't no mountain valley. I know I'm going to step on toes now because I don't know who's all preaching it, but I hear the phrase all the time, dark night of the soul. The dark night of the soul is if you get your eyes off the truth. Now, I know I'm going to get some people mad at me. You're going to tell me that the blood of Jesus is the most powerful thing and the work is finished and he's delivered me from the power of darkness and he's seated me with his son in the kingdom of his love. And I'm going to have to have this and this fallout and this weakness. And I got this little thing clinging and hiding. Not when I believe. Not when I get alone in the bedroom and say, thank you for freedom. Thank you, God, you've delivered me from the power of darkness. Watch this. Thank you. There ain't nothing my father, my father's father, my father's father's father could have done to stop the kingdom of God now. It's here. There's been a line drawn in the sand. There is freedom in my life. I don't need prayer. I've got you right now, and I'm declaring that you're in my life, and I'm free. I'm done living by feelings, memories, flashbacks, emotions. You are aligning everything according to truth, and I feel alive and on fire, and I thank you for you, God. Yeah? What would happen if somebody just goes in a bedroom and starts declaring and believing in freedom and doesn't just turn it into some Christian exercise? I'm not talking about Christian aerobics. I'm not talking about just quoting scripture, hoping it works. I'm talking about talking to him through the word. God, your love for me is unstoppable. Man, when I was lost, you knew where I was. When I had no clue who I was, you never lost sight of what you created me to be. On my darkest day, you knew me for who I was called to be. Your love has never failed. You're amazing. I've never been loved like this. I've never been accepted like this. I've never had to not work like this. 
I just receive what you say about me. I'm in, I'm washed, I'm clean, I'm holy, blameless, and above reproach, and nobody or nothing is changing my mind. Thank you for loving me. Wow. That'll get your hair standing up, and then those feelings, those feelings, those yeah, but, but feelings you don't live by, but those but God, those feelings, oh, you can live by them. Can you tell I'm crazy emotional? Ah, ah, Loud whisper, loud whisper, soft tone talk. ah, Can you see that? (laughs) But it's all channeled through truth. It's not at the cost of your identity. It doesn't condemn you. It doesn't put pressure on you. It doesn't decrease anything that he is. It's not an emotional whirlwind that has a negative effect. The emotions we grew up with, chaotic. And we psychologically assess them and label ourselves as such. And we think the way we grew up is normal. And he said, get born again. Christians have fought me on this thing. They fought me on this thing because their emotions are up and down. And they say, well, God gave us emotions. And they're emotional when they confront me. (laughs) Pastor, you're always talking about emotions and feelings and faith. And God gave us emotions. I said, honey, not the emotions that you grew up with. He didn't give you those. Adam gave you those. (laughs) Don't even wrap them up and hand them back to Adam. Just throw them away. (laughs) Come on, we were born into Adam. We got to get born. We were born separate from God. There ain't a person in this room that had a clue who you were when you were born. And life tried to tell you who you were. We're under the control of our circumstances, our memories, our childhood, our upbringing. And if you had a tough road, it pottered you like clay. And now your story became you. And none of it's truth. Because you were born into a lie. People cling to their story, whether it's good or bad, because it's the only place they ever found any sense of identity. And they think they got to value their heritage. Now they got this long impulse to find out their ancestry and their roots. Let me just save you a lot of time, money, and internet stuff. Just go back to the beginning, like Jesus said, and you'll find your father there. I know I get in trouble for some of this stuff I blurt out, but human sentiment is one of the most dangerous things I've seen in the body of Christ. It's human sentiment. I believe it came from the fall. It's, it's human sentiment. It's just sentiment. It's not true compassion. It's not love. It's just sentimental. Oh, oh, well. So all of a sudden, all these things matter more than what really matters most. And it's all about how I feel. We're supposed to love not our own lives unto death. We're supposed to be pilgrims and sojourners passing through because we're seeking a homeland. And then we're going to believe a gospel that makes it all about now and trying to get me through and making my now the best it can be instead of just saying, hey, I'm just passing through. I got a ticket to eternity. I'm a pilgrim, a sojourner because I believe this and I take it serious. I'm going to sow seeds all along the way, lay down my life, love, not take account of a suffer wrong. And I'm going to shine every step of the way because he said, let your light so shine. When you're discouraged, you're not shining. When you're frustrated, you're you're not shining. When you have unresolved conflicts, you're not shining. When you don't like your boss at work, you're not shining. When you don't communicate with your spouse, you're not shining. It's all deception. How's that for straight preaching? So all these things that give us permission to not shine have to be deception. There has to be a higher answer. It has to be a motive in life and a will in life that has to change. And all of a sudden, I can die to everything I've been so I can live to everything he is. And all of a sudden, you love not your own life unto death. And he answered it all for us. We just don't preach it that way. We come into the gospel for what he can do for us. He wants you to come into the gospel for how he can make you more like him. He said, if you come after me, there's something you got to do. Make sure you do it. And it's first on the list. If you come after me, you got to deny yourself. See, it's the biggest problem on the planet every day. Men waking up for themselves when they're made for God's image. Self-centeredness is so wretched. 
It's so anti-kingdom because it's anti-love. You can't be both. You can't be selfish and love. You can't love and be selfish. It's like there's no fellowship between light and dark, between angels and demons, between Belial, between God. There's no fellowship. There's no fellowship between love and selfishness. There's no communion. Those two can never be intimate. They can't have kids together. They don't, it doesn't work. There's some dangerous things we do. Like the gospel is yes and amen. He said, I didn't come with a gospel that's yes and no, but yes and amen. We've defined the gospel through the flesh. We got a lot of no's. In our, well, maybe he will, maybe he won't. Well, let's pray, who knows, maybe God will. How did we get maybe so and maybe not in our theology? Because we married yes and no. And their children are maybe so and maybe not. Let your yes be and your anything else is of the evil one. Scripture tells us all this. And yet we live in a psychological gospel and an analytical gospel that we've developed and we explain away all these scriptures. Yeah, but sometimes God just, well, you know, but yeah, but I had an aunt and we prayed and you know. And all of a sudden we're rewriting theology, but it ain't his life and what he said. And I promise you when heaven and earth passes away and his word remains, it isn't going to be your analytical assessment that's standing. You get offended at preaching like this. This isn't to protect what I'm preaching. This is to protect you. Watch this. You can weigh me and judge me on this if you want. It's your privilege. But if you get offended when somebody's talking this direct, that really locates a real true problem. Jesus said, blessed is the man who's not offended in me. You know who he was talking to when he said that? John the Baptist, who was offended because he was in prison and he's supposed to be the forerunner. And now he's in prison. And if you're really who you say you are, why am I sitting here? Go ask the, him if he's really who he says he is. How can John ask Jesus who he really is when John's the only man that really knew? He's the only man on the earth that really knew. When he was in Elizabeth's womb, in the womb, Mary walked in the room, and John, in the womb, starts freaking out. She says, whoa. Mary, she came and told her. She said, even the baby in my womb, as soon as she walked in, I heard your voice, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. John recognized his cousin. He's like, Jesus, this thing is going down. Woo! I perceive you. He's in the womb. That's a pretty serious calling yeah, yeah. from the womb. That's pretty sensitive spiritual stuff yeah, yeah. that a tiny little baby in a womb is going, the Lord. <laughs> wow. Wow. And now he's born and God hand raises him, wilderness, honey, locust. Hey, he probably looked like a wild man. <laughs> Then he comes out of the desert in that place. He ain't got no comb. He ain't got no toothbrush. He got little legs between his teeth. He got sticky honey on his beard. Repent! <laughs> what? <laughs> but did he know him? Did he know him? Did he know him? Watch what happened. He took his own life personal and ask a question that he already knew. And all of a sudden, the question is designed to cloud out what you know. And all of a sudden, you got three more questions that, that, that spring off of the question. Next thing you know, you're in this whirlwind of questions, and all of a sudden, it shadows over the things your heart always knew. 
That's called self-centered. That's called deception. And Jesus said, you go back and tell John what you both see and hear. Bam, bam, bam. And blessed is the man who's not offended or caused to stumble because of me. Then he turned to the people. The people didn't know what was going on. He wasn't slamming John, John publicly. But it's in our Bible, so we catch it. And then he turned and he esteemed John in front of the people. And then he, and then he said, but even the least of you in this kingdom that I'm bringing here is going to be greater than he. So if it was deception for John to be thinking that way, surely it's deception for us if the least of us is in a greater position than John. See, watch this. How can we be greater than John? John was proclaiming him. We're supposed to carry him. That sounds greater. John's proclaiming him. We're all admiring the prophetic. We're supposed to carry him. And when you see us, you're supposed to get a good look at him. Wow. Are you with me? That sounds greater. See, Jesus didn't come and just preach the word to us from the clouds. He put on a body and manifested it and walked it out. And then he said, now you got something to follow. Come on, guys. If you're really in, got to deny yourself. But let's take a walk. Follow me through life. We turned it into, if you don't know where you're going when you die, pray this prayer. We call that salvation. Salvation means healed, delivered, protected, preserved, made whole, and kept safe and sound. It's a now word. It almost always has to do with now, not then. The word salvation literally means totally delivered, set free, and restored. And we've turned the word saved in America into a destination when the bell rings. Instead of a life we live because we died to ourselves and live unto him. Are you all with me? Sorry I ran it and manifested today. It's late, isn't it? Is it late? What time are you usually done on a Sunday morning? Serious? So I... No, I did all that, and I'm early. Is that what you're telling me? That, see, that has to be the Lord right there. That's, that's it. Listen, he really loves us. He's not mad at us. He's not frustrated. He said, a sermon like this isn't God saying, would you guys get it straight? He's cheering you on into what he paid for. Come on, while you were yet a sinner, he sent his son. This is just a family meeting. Are we family? Yeah. This is just a pep talk. It's a family meeting. It's saying, hey, guys, take earnest heed. Yeah. It's safe for you. Don't lose sight. We're stirring up for love and good works. Let's stay in the race. Stay in the game. We're all together. Let's live locked armed, even if we're far apart. Let's wake up for the same reason, same goal. Let's live for the same thing. Oneness, unity of faith, unity of the Spirit. Isn't that awesome? See, this is how we can be one. So I'm going to drive back home today, back to York, Pennsylvania. Some of you live right here, right? So you could wake up Monday morning, God willing. I wake up Monday morning. God, we're far apart. We don't even see each other. We don't have each other's number. We ain't texting. We ain't talking. But guess what? She's waking up for the same reason I'm waking up. A little different calling ministerially, maybe some different graces and gifts and the way God flows through our life. But watch this. Same motive. His image shine as a light. Christ in us, the hope of glory. All of a sudden, she's waking up to live that way. I'm waking up to live that way. You see the army that's rising up? No, no. I'm talking about people that are really in this thing, like sold out, surrendered in this thing. Ain't taking no account of a suffer wrong. Ain't going to let nobody get on their nerves because they got new ones. They ain't selling cheap. They ain't going to cop out with language. Well, you know, I've been trying for a long time, but you don't know how hard it's been. And you don't know how they've been doing this over and over. How would you feel if you were in my shoes? Are you telling me you'd be okay? And I'm just supposed to be okay and just take it? Look, I ain't nobody's doormat. Well, that kind of language is your justification for never walking in Christ. But you can go to church. You can still go to church. You're welcome. But you'll never manifest him. You'll never walk in the light if that's your resume. You're going to allow things to matter more than what matters most. You try to run that language by Jesus and see if it works. When did you ever see Jesus drop the cross and say, I've had enough? 
These people ticked me off, Lord. Are you kidding me? The whole way up this mountain to Golgotha. Bad enough, they beat me to no description. I can't even tell who I am. They don't even know it's me. They beat me and beat me for doing nothing. I've been doing nothing but good. But I'll tell you what ticked me off. It pushed me too far. That Barabbas thing, it just gets me so mad. He killed a man. He killed a man. And I raised the dead. He causes conspiracy. And I'm pursuing peace. And these knuckleheads want to kill me? I ain't dying for nobody. Come on. I know we're laughing, but that's serious. You, come on. What would you be doing if you were in his shoes? And all you did was right. And all you meant was right. And you prayed and your motive was clean. And everybody's pointing the fingers if you're the bad one and you're the problem and you're the heretic and you're the false teacher. And he's from the Father. And they're saying you're from the devil day after day after day for years and nothing changed about him that impresses me yeah, yeah, yeah. I am not here to sing to him I am here to follow him I am here to live in him because he's living in me in my day of well I feel well they shouldn't have, well that hurt well how come well that wasn't fair has ended for me 26 years ago that's why you see me the way I am I'm either a great actor and I need some kind of Christian hypocritical Emmy award <laughs> or 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 I see this thing and I'm going to be this way the next time you see me maybe a little worse <laughs> why worse because I just might know him a little bit more. Whew. Are you with me? So I get this a lot from Christians. Don't you do this? Well, nobody can live that way. Oh, I get it a lot? Well, nobody can live that way. Well, Pastor, what you're preaching, nobody can really live. Well, you just got some special grace then, and you just got this quick revelation. Not everybody. I mean, I'm just processing. Okay, so 10 years later, you still have the same issue. You just, you just download and slow. The circle just spinning. Just spin. 10 years just waiting, spinning, just download. Come on, that's pitiful. Don't you buy into that. You don't even believe that. Why are you protecting something? Come on, man. Is it all right if I'm talking this plane to you? Y'all just said you love me, so I'm just figuring you do so I can just... And just get up here and, and you just go, yeah. <laughs> you guys all right? Yeah. Or are you asking me that? <laughs> See, if anybody says, dude, I think you're out of your mind, I just say, no, I'm probably out of yours. Yeah. That's probably all that's happening. I'm just probably just out of yours. And I'm over here captured and held prisoner in the mind of Christ. I just know the emotions I grew up with were never productive. I know they gave me a right to be a lot of things that didn't look like Jesus. Somebody will stand up and confront that and stop saying it's normal human life and behavior. What's the born again life look like? What's Christ in me really look like? What's a man look like when he's received a measure of grace that Jesus paid for? What would your life look like if everything he paid for would land on it and manifest? The church might want to crucify that because it's in denial and ain't keeping it real and ain't being relatable. We're not supposed to relate to where we've all been. We're supposed to relate to him. Wow. We're not following our old experiences and making that rock solid theology. We're following him. We have reduced grace by following our experience. And we've allowed our own experience to trump the grace of God that's here to change our experience. Oh, I've heard it in the language all the time. 
Hey, well, you got to keep it real, brother. Well, we can't really. Well, pastors will get up front and say, man, I got so angry on Wednesday. Oh, by the way, I mean, what? So you guys weren't angry? Don't look at me like that. Who wasn't angry this week? Anybody in here that got angry this week? And everybody will raise their hands. And, and then he'll say, well, those of you that didn't raise your hand, we'll have an altar call for all the liars. What he's, <laughs> what he's saying is, you have to live that way. And he's damning you to live that way and saying, if you don't, you're in denial and you're lying. But when I read my Bible, it says put off anger. It doesn't say manage it. It says put it off. It says fornication and passion, evil desire, put it to death. It didn't say find self-control. Harness your feelings. It says kill life as you knew it apart from him so you can put on life as he is. Oh, that's what your Bible teaches. But see, a man can't stand up here and teach that if he's still living the other way. He's got to find a message that fits his life. So if he's falling apart on Wednesday and he's justifying anger, now he has no ability to repent and never put it off because he's saying it's normal. And if you're saying it ain't normal, you don't fit into my world, so you're in denial. Wow, that's so good. Come on, I've heard this in church. Well, if you meet one of these people at church, it's just always okay. They're just always okay. Oh, I'm okay. Oh, hey, I'm good. You need to get them alone when ain't nobody around and pin them down and say, okay, brother, it's just you and me. Now, how are you really doing? Why? Because you can't believe somebody can be okay. But now we're preaching freedom. Wow. We're preaching freedom, but you don't believe people. Now, I understand people hide behind things, and I understand people put on masks, and I understand that sometimes you need discernment to try to help them with that. But when you imply that somebody can't be okay, that's a problem. You ask Jesus. Whew, whew. You ask Jesus while he's being crucified. And he'd have looked you in the eye and said, I'm fine. I'm right where I chose to be. I'm better than okay. <laughs> While he's being crucified. <laughs> I hope you're getting at that when that one's ministering to me. I'm going to have to get alone on that one today. <laughs> He's okay. Ain't that something? We think we got a problem when somebody's mistreating us and the cars broke down all at the same time. <laughs> We're in a quandary needing counsel wondering why our prayers ain't working. And we don't even realize we've bit into a self-centered, self-serving gospel and created a God that's here to meet our needs instead of make us like Him. Jesus said, when you see me, You've already seen him. That Jesus said, follow me. And if you believe in me, the things I do, you will do also. And any man that abides in him ought to walk even as he walked. That's plenty of scripture to bear witness and confirm. Y'all good? <laughs> whatever that was oh there it is just trying to find thunder in there <laughs> stand your feet with me would you look I'm not calling you up here to, to an order call to surrender or do any of that you do that from your heart you do that how you live def defines if you're going to surrender you know you can have an order call and you can cry and you can leave and not take earnest tea to what you heard I don't think that we always have to have an order call I think we have to learn to live sincere to our convictions learn how to guard our own heart and learn how to follow him fair enough yes. listen we can live this guys He's just yielding and surrendering. So I want you as you're standing there just to say yes to him if you hear what you're hearing this morning is truth. You just tell him you're, you're all in. You want to live this way. I want to follow you, Jesus. Man, I want to carry my cross in the middle of persecution, in the middle of unfairness, in the middle of people wrongly judging me. I want to be able to look you in the eyes and be sincere and say I'm okay because I get it. Nobody owes me a thing. I'm on the earth to shine. I'm on the earth to love. Father, would you let love be that real in our lives? 
Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to come and just pour grace into the heart and understanding of every person in this room. God, I thank you. There's no condemnation in this message. There's inspiration. There's conviction. There's forward progress. There's yeah, yeah, yeah. See, see, it's not, man, I don't even know. I got a long way to go. No, you ain't got a long way to go. Somebody just lit a light on the trail. There's, there's clarity in front of you. you. It ain't about you got a long way to go. You got somewhere to go. You got direction, you got vision, and you got purpose. And you got something that exposes those little foxes that are always trying to take the precious fruit off the vine. You got something to expose them things and to get them wrong mentalities and them wrong motives out of your life. Yeah? So, Father, I just thank you right now. I just thank you right now for what you're doing in us. I thank you for what you're doing in this house. I thank you for what you're doing by your spirit through your son. I don't normally do it this way, but it is on my heart. David and I even talked about it a little on the way here. You need healing in your body. Why would we do that right now? Because healing comes through the forgiveness of sins. We've been forgiven of everything we've ever done. We preach on righteousness all the time. We preach on God loving us and seeing us as sons and daughters. He forgives our sin. He heals our disease. He said to the man they lowered through the roof, he said, take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. I promise you, those men that tore off that roof did not tear off the roof to hear that. They tore off the roof to see their friend healed. But Jesus was always teaching. And he said, take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. Men began to squabble and bicker in their hearts. He said, why do you think evil in your hearts? What is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise and walk. But to show you the Son of Man has the power to forgive sin. Go ahead, son. Rise and walk. What's he connecting? The forgiveness of sin to healing. So to say you're forgiven is to say you're healed. To say you're healed is to say you're forgiven. Yeah? He says, is any among you sick? Let them ask. The elders of the church, anoint them. Pray the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith will save the sick. And if they've committed any sin, it shall be forgiven. Matthew 10, he said, go preach saying the kingdom of God is here and then heal the sick. In Luke 10, he said, go heal the sick and then tell them. So whether it's a tell and show or a show and tell, it's the same. Now, I know the old school preachers and the old school mentality say you have to preach the word first because of Matthew 10. But Luke 10 says, go heal the sick and then tell them the kingdom's here. I've done that countless times in my life. I'm into preaching the word and seeing the sick healed. But I'm into seeing the sick healed and then preaching the word. So if you're sick in your body right now, I just want you to thank God that your sins are forgiven. And don't get in a quandary over sickness and say, yeah, but I was prayed for 50 times and I was prayed for by very anointed people and here I am, there's gotta be something I'm doing wrong and I gotta be blocking and there's something blocking my healing, there's something blah, 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 blah. And now you're so shook from identity and a solid foundation. Here's what I want you to do today. This is all I'm giving you permission to do today. Please do this. Just believe this one thing. He has to love me or he'd have never sent his son. He has to. You can't say, well, if God loved me, how come? Stop. Stop, stop, stop. That's going to create something negative in your life. Look, stop. If he didn't love you, why'd he send his son? You got to stay there. How are you ever going to get rooted and grounded if you don't stay there? How are you ever going to let faith work through love if love isn't settled? If love's up for question, you'll never be established in it. He loves you because he sent his son. So if you're going through sickness right now, just understand that he loves you or he'd have never sent his son. God, because you love me, you forgave me through the blood of your son. And because you forgave me, you make all things new and you heal me. Father, I thank you for healing all through this room. I thank you, Holy Spirit, come. Yep, regenerate, restore, and make new. Heal joints, ligaments, muscles. Touch organs, God. Touch minds, memories, focus. God, thank you for taking clouds just taking clouds out of the focus of people's lives. Holy Spirit, would you just move right now, just back through this room and just touch everything along the way that's less than wholeness. Would you just come and have your way? Would you just move through this room and heal and restore? Every sickness leave. Every weakness go. 
healing come in Jesus name joints thank you Lord arthritis leave diabetes you go in the authority of Jesus name hearts you be strong you work livers and kidneys and organs you function digestive system stomachs stomach lining be restored heartburn I just hear heartburn no more heartburn in the authority of Jesus name just just all kinds of you think it's simple you think it's small he paid for it all he loves you healing come in this house in Jesus name Holy Spirit thank you Father thank you Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can live this thing, guys. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor. We can live this thing. Don't let anything talk you out of it. You say yes, Lord, and you continue to say yes, Lord, and you looking unto Jesus who authored this thing and started this thing called faith. You're never going to see it finished if you don't keep looking unto him. So if you can't find it in his life, don't allow it in yours. If the way you're thinking doesn't fit in his mouth, get it out of yours. Let's follow Jesus. Because he said, Father, when they're one, like you and I are one, then the world know that you really did send your son. Let us be that one like him and the Father are one. In Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, thank you, Lord. I just felt healing released through this room. Check your bodies out when you get a chance. Just stand in faith. I love that. It's so beautiful. He was telling me how many healings have been happening, and, and I was like, man, I just want to continuously remind the body of Christ that he's our healer by his stripes we are healed and I just thank you God for your presence that's come to you know his presence follows the word his word follows the presence and the spirit and the word must agree and thank you, God, for just massive heart transformation here today. Such truth being revealed. Wow, we've really been upgraded here today. We want to hide your word in our hearts, oh God, that we may not ever sin against you. Come on, it's possible. It's supposed to be our reality. We hide your word in our heart, Lord, that we may never sin against us, against you. Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's also in the same very long chapter. God wants to just take each one of us so much higher. So I bless you. He's just here, still here doing things. What we're going to do is we're going to put some music on. If you just want to meditate, if you just want to lay at the altar, if you just want to sit in your seat and just, I don't want to hurry you out of the room. We're in no hurry. You can just sit here and bask in his presence. You can think on the things that were spoken. Meditate on the words, scriptures that were given. And, uh, if you can, we'll be back at 2.30. We bless you in advance. Thank you for being the beautiful bride that you are. We bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Pro Team. Just, just give us something on, on a playlist that we can uh, do some soaking in the sanctuary for those who would like to just sit at his feet. Thank you, Lord. We bless you.